Well, let's, let me just welcome everyone here. Uh, my name is James Wilson from uh, the Research on Research Institute, and it's our great pleasure to be uh, teaming up with uh, the Centre for Open Science and AMOS uh, to bring you uh, this series of virtual symposia in the lead up to the uh, big main Meta Science 2023 meeting, which of course gets underway in Washington, D.C. Uh, next Tuesday. Um, and this session has excited uh, more interest than most. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel. Uh, here to discuss whether academic journals are broken. I'm going to hand over to Jess Butler, who's going to chair the session. Jess is uh, a research fellow uh, in the Institute of Applied Health Sciences at the University of Aberdeen. Jess, over to you. So a very warm welcome, everyone. Basically, I think this is my dream symposium. I ask people who over the years I've learned a tremendous amount from. Um, I'm a data scientist basically in Aberdeen. <laughs> and very interested in open science and convinced that open science methods are key to improving the quality of our research. But what I have found in learning about registering your hypotheses, oh, there's James, hey James, and making your data and code open and publishing negative results is that while I think these are the right things to do for more rigorous science, for better research, for better quality scientific record, we don't get rewarded for these things. So I'm not sure the powers that be recognize yet that this is the better way of working, which leaves us with not a scientific methods problem, but a research culture problem, which can be incredibly overwhelming, depressing. But when thinking about a place to start changing research culture, I think we should focus on publishing. So commercial academic publishers play far too powerful of a role in deciding what research is good, what research reaches the public. So my goal today is this session will be in two halves. The first half will be three experts talking about the problems with current academic publishing. And then we'll have a chance to chat. A huge focus on Q&A for this for me. So we have these people in the room, let's take advantage of it. And then we'll have three short talks, all these talks only 10 minutes each about what to do next. So fine, academic publishing is broken, what do we do now? And then we'll have another chance to chat with the panel, scheme, discuss, debate. So with that, I will dive into the first half. So our first speaker is Dorothy Bishop, Emeritus Professor of, De of Developmental Neuropsychology at Oxford. I know Dorothy from her role in founding the UK Reproducibility Network and from her fabulous long running blog, Bishop Blog. I will put a link to all of these uh, sites that I'm name dropping in the intros into our chat. And I think Dorothy has the best uh, retirement plan of anyone I've ever heard. She's basically moved into a sleuth role in, in determining problems with paper mills and academic publishing. So Dorothy, I turn it over to you. Okay, um, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a bit of a cough today, but thank you so much for um, inviting me. And for sort of having the idea of this uh, particular session, um, I'm going to dive straight in and be, it's a provocative title, so I'm going to dive in and be provocative. Um, and so first, for those of you who are not aware of the phenomenon of paper mills, which might not have affected your area too much, um, <clears throat> they are basically just commercial operations rather similar to essay mills for students where you can basically pay somebody and you, you will get a publication and it's fraudulent, basically. Um, it may be plagiarized, it may be generated by a computer or whatever. Um, and this guy, Nick Wise, in fact, now has a Twitter account where he puts up authorship for sale ads, which he scours the web for um, in WhatsApp, Facebook groups, Telegram channels. There are people who are quite overtly doing this sort of selling. Um, and there, there are other references here if you want to pursue the idea of what's a paper mill in more detail. Um, the, this is an example of the sort of thing that you get if you uh, allow paper mills. Um, it's a paper that purports to tell you that you can predict autism from EEG. Anybody who knows anything about EEG will find it extremely weird. The language is, is, is weird because it contains these things called tortured phrases, which is a phrase that Guillaume Cabanac invented. And he in fact scours the literature for, for these weird phrases, which are a hallmark of some paper mill types of output. Um, and what you can see is that um, words have been changed. I'm having difficulty forwarding to the next one. Hmm. Let me try clicking. Oh, there we go. Um, 
And uh, you can see the words that have been changed so that you have wonderful things like <clears throat> instead of EMG artifacts, you have EMG antiquities. Uh, and instead of signal to noise ratio, you have signal to commotion uh, proportion, which is rather wonderful. <clears throat> but you would have thought this shouldn't happen. You shouldn't, these sort of things shouldn't get into the literature because peer review should protect us against these fake papers. And the things that happen with paper mills is that sometimes things get published because they're just very convincing fakes. And there are some areas of science where this is a really big problem. Um, sometimes also uh, the author is are invited to suggest reviewers and these are actually friends or fake reviewers. Uh, but the more worrying one is where you have an editor who's actually complicit in the fraud and who is waving through fake papers or indeed encouraging them and also using fake reviews so that what is supposed to be a peer-reviewed literature isn't peer-reviewed at all. It's full of this garbage. Um, and the publishers have been portraying themselves as victims of these paper mills. Now, paper mills have come on board relatively recently at scale. They've been around for quite a while, but they've really sort of grown and mushroomed, a bit like a sort of virus sort of entering the system. And it's it's understandable that um, initially publishers wouldn't know how to cope with this. And they have indeed taken some steps to tackle paper mills. Um, there's a very good report by the Committee of Publication Ethics and STM, which is telling you what the problem is and how we need to deal with it and having some ideas. Um, Publishers have been at the forefront of trying to train editors and reviewers. There have recently been some mass retractions of things that are known to be fraudulent paper mill products. And they're very interested in developing criteria that will allow them to detect paper mill products. These are typically AI systems that are fascinating in, and tr try and keep them out of the literature. This is all good, but I have, I'm increasingly dubious about the sincerity of at least some of the publishers. And why is that? Well, there's this huge conflict of interest. Um, so they've been encouraging huge expansion of certain journals. So this is an, um, some journals that are published by Hindawi. It's recently been in trouble because it's been noticed that <clears throat> these are paper mill products. But you can see this is the number of publications over time. And that in 2021, 2022, it went mad. Uh, these are mostly papers in special issues. Um, and there's sort of many fold increase in the number of papers. Uh, why would a journal want to do that? Well, if you look at the actual income that they're making from this, it's astronomical. It's, it's in, the, in one year, um, this one, Computational Intelligence and Neuroscience, was making over $8 million. Um, dollars, and that's just one journal. And there's many, many of these journals, and this is also just one year. So you can see that the financial incentives are rather remarkably large. This week, uh, I was a bit shocked to find real confirmation that this is not just a problem with some dodgy uh, editors, because an editor was actually removed from the Journal of Political Philosophy. And the story, this is still a very new story, it only came out this week. Um, and it may be that there's some more subtle details that we're not aware of. But um, basically, I assumed if somebody says an editor's been removed, it's for doing something wrong. But this editor apparently was removed because of communication problems. And another member of the editorial board, uh, uh, who's also the editor of another Wiley journal, said that what was happening is that editors were being asked to... Uh, publish a lot more papers. So again, to replicate this picture where things go up in scale. Um, and the editors weren't very happy because they felt they were being made to relax standards and to handle rid ridiculous amounts of stuff. So this is, this is, I think, really worrying if you're seeing a, a publisher doing this. There's also, um, I've been very interested in the idea that there's been real negligence in how editors have been appointed for special issues and how dodgy editors get into place. So I got fascinated by the case of a man called Kaifa Zhao, who was named as editor for one special issue in one of these journals, Computational Intelligence and Neuroscience, and it also another special issue in the Journal of Environmental and Public Health. In 2022, he handled 284 papers for these two special issues, and he was very efficient. Um, he managed to get an initial response after peer review to authors uh, in 19 days on average. Um, Unfortunately, many of these papers have been identified as, as paper mill products and have comments to that effect on pub peer. A lot of them are what I have termed AI gobbledygook sandwiches, where they've just got a load of rubbish sort of 
in the middle uh, in the middle of the paper. There's a bit from Wikipedia about artificial intelligence methods. Um, if you Google him, he's a PhD student at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So what the hell is he doing editing two special issues for a rep, so-called reputable journal? I wrote to Hong Kong Polytechnic University and they actually conducted an investigation, which is very impressive. Um, and they concluded he actually wasn't to blame. He was not the editor. He'd given his email password to his PhD supervisor, who's now at another Chinese university uh, and had been using it. So um, this man hasn't been responsive to emails, nor his university has told me they are going to investigate. That was a while ago, but we'll see if they do. I informed Hindawi about this in well, in fact, I told them about some of the individual papers this guy was publishing, which were frankly crazy, uh, way back. Um, but in 2023, um, I informed them about this and uh, they said, thank you very much. We'll look into it sort of thing. But then last month in March or two months ago now, um, a new article appeared in this journal where he had been the editor. So it makes you think they're not really being taking it that seriously. Um, and there are other grossly inadequate responses to reports of paper mill activity. I mean, this is just par for the course, I'm afraid. And I think James may, Heathers may tell us more about this. But um, this is just one example that's that's live at the moment. Alexander Magazinov sent a detailed account of a citation cartel operating in the Journal of Energy Storage with names of the people, a big network of people are all citing each other and placing dubious stuff. Um, in September 2022, the Committee of Publication Ethics agreed to look into the case. And then there's been lots of emails to and fro between him and Cope and him and Cope. And Cope seemed to be trying to make something happen, but nothing happens. Eventually, a new editor is appointed, which is interesting, but still no action. But then just in March, there's another special issue published with members of the Citation Cartel as editors. So, like, things are not happening. Um, so, in sum... Paper mills are a massive problem. They pollute the scientific record. There's a lot of publishers who have been negligent in responding to the threat of paper mills, despite repeated warnings. Not all publishers, and I would say some of the society publishers are fine and are really taking it seriously. Um, but the responses that publishers are making appear designed to appease critics rather than to really deal with the problem at source. And I have to say, the more I look at it, the more it looks very similar to the way oil companies will pretend that they care about climate change, but actually it's all just greenwashing activities and uh, they're not really going to change at, at source because it's just not worth it from the point of view of their income. And that's it. Thank you, Dorothy. So we're having some trouble with opening the chat. This may be a question for Wendy, opening the chat to all participants. It's currently only open to panelists, but folks can put questions into the Q&A box. We're going to let them um, accumulate for three talks and then we'll chat. So thinking about Dorothy's talk, since we publish our science in a pay per publish model, I want to get my research out there, I pay. It behooves these commercial publishers to publish many, 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 many more articles and just open up the money, money bags, which means the editors have little or no control or time to control what's coming in, which, I mean, the stuff Dorothy posts on Twitter and Mastodon, these articles are word salad. There's not even a pretense at making them look like real research sometimes. So the, basically there are a hundredfold more articles. Guess what? Some of them are going to actually be like generated by AI. This is how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. So next on to James Heathers, who we thank for joining us at an ungodly hour, his time. Um, James is the Chief Scientific Officer at CypherSkin. I know him better as the co-host of Everything Hurts, which is my favorite podcast. Um, they have 200 some odd episodes. I can recommend all of them, especially his interviews with other people. And especially if you're looking at the interviews, the interviews with Michael Eisen that Everything Hurts did were absolutely great. So just like Dorothy James, has a day job at CypherSkin, but also is sort of very well known for his efforts in error detection in the academic record. So he is here to break your heart about the impossibility of correcting the scientific record when you're an error detective. Over to you, James. What a tremendous time for the VPN to decide that I'm misbehaving. You look clear from here. Okay, superb. Um, well, thank you all for joining me. If those of you on the East Coast, a special shout out to everyone else who got up, got up at six o'clock in the morning. This is in fact the middle of my night, but you know, I thought this was important. 
And um, it's always good fun to talk about the impossibility of things. So I'm going to make the assumption at this point that um, everyone knows the sort of basic mechanics of uh, pre-publication review the way that we typically do it. Um, what journalists, how they work, um, the process by which pre-publication review is achieved, et cetera. That should be fine, I think, given the, uh, given the audience here. So let's say that a hypothetical body of papers existed and we wrote to the editors in that case. What would happen if the papers were really bad and we were... Jimmy, am I not sharing my screen? You are not. We are seeing your face. Oh, not a that's, that, no, 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 that's, that's a terrible idea. Let's not, let's not do the face thing. Okay, okay there we go. That. There we go. Okay. So if we have a hypothetical body of papers, let's say they're really terrible and we uh, talk, to the ed talk to the editor. Let's say that proceeds over a period of time and uh, how bad could it possibly be? Well, this took me about 20 minutes to reconstruct and I've never been able to do this before previously uh, simply because I didn't have the time. This is the best one I've got. I've called this slide, why don't you complain through the official channels? So this is a, uh, a case um, within the... Uh, social psychology, um, the author's French, the details aren't important, I just need you to see the timeline here. Now, this was very difficult to reconstruct, but I did actually manage to find all the pieces with a little bit of help from the erstwhile Nick Brown, who was more involved in this than me at every single point. Now, this is still going, this particular case, which is a back and forth between uh, Nick and myself and various editors and uh, psychological societies um, and national research integrity societies and probably some other parties that I'm forgetting. And the reason that I'm forgetting is because it's been going on for 90 months. Now, those of you who are good enough at arithmetic to probably notice that these papers were a problem in the first place would realise that 90 months is seven and a half years. For me, that's uh, a postdoc in Poland, uh, back to Boston, a postdoc, a research scientist job, leaving academia altogether. Um, Cypher skin, which was three years until recently, I forgot to tell Jess to update my bio, and now, <laughs> and now another startup. So this is why when you, uh, you see people who are excised about the scientific record in general, it does not make a lot of sense in some respects to talk to the editors involved because you may be stuck in a process that takes 90 months. You don't have to go through the individual pieces here, but I just wanted everyone to see that. So I'm going to try and hit this quickly because it's uh, 10 minutes, and I've tried to think about this in terms of the highest, the highest level that we can think about mechanics here possible. Dorothy's already really ably covered some of this, but um, I run companies now, so I have a tendency to think in very high level sort of executive babble, but I've found that's really helpful in meta science over the last few years. So let's think about this in terms of markets for a bit. Firstly, journals and their publications are technically infinite. If you want to start one yourself, you can. You're allowed to. That's perfectly okay. Um, many of the smaller publishers, you can go and read their Wikipedia article uh, entries, are fascinating because uh, one day someone had the idea that they should be in charge of something. So they started a public, <laughs> they started a series of publications, and now they exist. And that's literally the end of the story. You are allowed to be entrepreneurial in this space, uh, like our first while previous PhD student. Secondly. Everything can be published somewhere. Any given week paper, any paper mill paper, um, any paper that's vaguely coherent will eventually find a happy home in some outlet or publication somewhere. Thirdly, commercial journals have to continue their business trajectory. And if there's one thing that I think is a source that's underappreciated in learning about how the mechanics of publications work, I strongly advise you to go to the SEC website 
and look for the documents that are provided uh, in share prospectuses. But when a publisher goes through an IPO, initial public offering from a private company to a public company, and they have to tell the government what's up, basically, all of the financial details, all of the mechanics. It's great. Uh, because basically, you will see a business model that says, we will continue to have more papers. We will continue to have what they call market capture, as in all these people who publish in the journals that we own the title of, will continue to publish in them because they have to. So they think of those things in completely different terms to you. Repeat business. Um, the longevity, um, monopoly. <laughs> uh, but if you put all these three points together, what it actually amounts to is there's, there's an upward pressure that's been collectively maintained over the amount of publications in the first place. So we are going to need more peer reviewers, more editors, uh, and more space for everything to be read. <sighs> I think everyone is probably familiar with this to some degree because you can uh, you can find papers complaining about this uh, in the formal sense, making many of the same points that we're making today back to about the 1960s. Uh, none of that is new. So, um, as Jeff said, I have a long history of complaining and being difficult about um, things that have been published in various scientific journals in various fields over a long period of time. And if there's one thing that's changed since I started doing it about a decade ago, I think I've started to have more empathy for the people who are on the other end of the spectrum. Because what happens when we have a big collective upward pressure on the amount of papers that are being published and need to be handled and the amount of editors who need to be involved? What happens is we're going to need more editors. So in general, over time, purely by virtue of the numbers involved, they are less likely to be fully trained. They are less likely to have handled something like this before, and they're less likely to have people around them to help them because they're not part of a community that considers them to be sort of informally trained over time. Uh, they're just thrown into the job sight unseen for the most part. Uh, the role of editor in this case is, um, is very similar to the role of peer reviewer in that there is a uh, not there is not a formal mechanism for learning to do it, nor is there an informal uh, method of apprenticeship a lot of the time. And of course, these people are busy because everyone is busy. As might be expected, retractions take time, effort, and money. And I say retractions there, but I also mean uh, the issue of uh, a correction or an expression of concern or any number of other mechanisms that are for formally investigating something that might be a problem in the meta-scientific sense. Um, my thinking of this for the last couple of years has been coloured by policy work that I've started doing for um, a couple of journals, thinking about... Well, what would a process like this ideally involve? And the conversations that I'm waiting to have and the things that are most interesting are actually coming from the lawyers who are involved in this process in the back end. Now, a lot of people who are editors to a journal may not have even met the counsel that works with the publication body, who are the people in many respects that are approving whether or not something like this can happen in the first place. Now, that's, of course, at the very top end uh, good journals, we might say, where people are compelled to take this sort of thing seriously. And below that, there is significantly less legal representation and significantly more, I'm sorry, I lost your email. Um, not everyone will keep emailing you back for 90 months, trust me. In general, uh, the same thing happens with editors. It happened when you make data requests to authors. So a wonderful paper last year by Gabalica et al. Now I think 6.8% of authors who made a data availability statement will actually send you data from the paper. Editors are part of that community. Editors are part of those uh, same people who do not see the engagement in a post-publication process as part of their job. Um, they're just also making decisions about that at a formal level. So they're getting back to you uh, very uncommonly in a more important way. Um, it's nice to be more formally ignored. Now, here's the big one for right now. I don't have time to get into this or what I'm doing for work right now, um, which does involve artificial intelligence. 
This is all going to get a lot, a lot worse because the one thing that large language models, which everyone is presently calling artificial intelligence, but in my opinion, isn't, the one thing that they are really good at is stringing words together in order. And they can do that in a way that's infinitely more. We've obviously, we had uh, nonsense generators for scientific papers for a very, very long time. And no doubt uh, that will be touched on by other speakers in the discussion. But large language models are really good at it by comparison. And the level of interest and excitement around them uh, and the, the, the way that the, the tech industry has responded by building services around uh, the services that are available for them to buy themselves is, uh, is quite startling right now. There are probably spaces now where there's probably 50, 60 companies, even just within a niche. There is an explosion of people who are paying attention to how do we get a computer to put words in order? We already have an upwards pressure problem now. The next two years are going to be really interesting. And by really interesting, I mean that. One minute, James. One minute, super. So a few more ancillary points and then I'm done. Even if correcting the record matters, um, if it takes 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 months, if it takes 90 months, it may not even happen enough. Even, even if you could get credit for doing it as a meta scientist, it may not happen quickly enough for it to have any bearing or relevance on your career. It certainly didn't for me. Um, that is, it's just uh, it, the system is not does not presuppose it. It's not set up to reward it. But at the same time, it also doesn't work quickly enough to reward it if you wanted it to. Journals are wildly unequipped for the headspace and resources necessary to relitigate things that they've already published. And there is no formal cross-country support for being able to do any of this work. And I, these are the points that I thought to include when someone sent me the teaser title with the word impossibility in it. This concludes my discussion of impossibilities. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. So we'll have Q&A after the next short talk. So we'll be able to hear more. And I, just to like reiterate James's point, these commercial publishers are operating as designed. So you can open up their business plans and they are just like, yes, we will publish a hundredfold more articles. Hooray. And we will hire and not pay a hundred more editors and not support them and not introduce them to our legal counsel. So I, there's, they're not hiding it, right? This is a commercial business and they want more article processing fees, let's go. Um, James, you had a nice talk that I can't find on a quick Google with an F word in it. Uh, it was like an hour long talk somewhere about- Yes, I have many talks with an F word. <laughs> no, like in the, in the title. And it was about um, similarly, like looking over the SEC filings for these company prospectuses. I'll have uh, yeah. a think. Pop it uh, into the chat. Yes, I can, I can provide that for you. Um, you may okay. find it difficult to Google from a work computer. Same. Okay, so our next speaker and our last speaker of this first half before we open the floor to chat is Bjorn Brems. He is a professor of neurogenetics at the University of Regensburg. I know him also from his blog, which I will pop into the chat. If you are looking for a place to go to find well-evidenced research on how bad academic publishing can be as a business. So again, they're not hiding it. And Bjorn has done a great job of synthesizing a lot of this evidence from the perspective of people have to, who have to use these businesses to prove to their bosses that they're worth promoting. Um, so Bjorn's talk is called, Publishers Are Drowning in Money. What are they doing with all the cash? Over to you, Bjorn. All right, thank you very much. If you thought after Dorothy and James' uh, short presentations, oh my God, how can it be worse? I'll try, I'll try to explain how it can be. At least for me, it can be even worse. Um, so this should be the right screen. Yes, that's, you should all see the title now, right? Publishers drowning money. What are they doing with all the cash? Looks good. And, and so one might wonder how, if, if, you know, if, if the quality that they publish is so bad, um, and reproducibility projects show that this is not just a paper mill problem. Even the uh, the articles that are nominally okay still can't be reproduced to a large fraction, somewhere between 
80 to 40 percent. Uh, so around, you know, if you average it all out, about half of the experimental research that is published is not reproducible in one way or another. So how, how did they end up making so much money off of that? And one of the ways in which that happened, uh, there you go, one of the ways in which that happened has been noticed a very long time ago when it was still all about uh, subscription publishing. You see, this is from a, ca a case from July 2003. And this is when... Springer wanted to buy Bertelsmann, which is just, you know, it's about a merger. It's a, uh, a merger procedure and there's EU regulation that has to look into that. And what they found is that these publishers are monopolists from the point of view of functional interchangeability, which is the main criterion for something being a market. Two different publications could hardly be regarded as substitutable by the end users, the readers. And this is very obvious, obvious for us. Every article should and, and usually does only exist once. And so the person or entity that owns it can charge whatever they want for reading. But the same is true, of course, obviously for journals. If I'm a, bio I'm a biologist, I cannot publish in physics journals. And uh, as long as I don't have a, um, a permanent position or as long as I didn't have a permanent position, I also can't just publish in any old bio biology journal. It has to be a certain rank in order to get a job. So essentially at my topic, at my rank, there's only one journal in most cases. Um, that I can reasonably publish in. So from all perspectives, be it as an author or being as a reader, reader they have a monopoly uh, position or a position with very, very little or hardly any competition, which means that you can charge a lot of money. So that's where all the money is coming from. Then the question is, well, to make a lot of profit, uh, it means that my costs should be really low. And so we looked around at some of the smaller publishers and asked them, hey, so uh, how much does it cost you to publish something? And here you see the different steps that one needs to um, publish. So first you have to handle the online submission. You have to give them a DOI, you detect plagiarism, you do, uh, check the references, you produce the output, you have to go indexing, all that sort of stuff. This is just one example. And that is also an example from a publisher that sits in a middle to low income country. So this may be on the low end, the $200 per article. So this is per article. Um, and so we did, uh, uh, together with uh, Alexander Grossman, he's the expert in this. He checked, okay, if I wanted to be, uh, as James said, anybody can start a, a publisher or a journal right now. Uh, if you wanted to be, what would your costs be? And we checked it out and we calculated it in a way that was very publisher friendly, so to say. And we came up with that an, an average article, if one would make this, if one would do this now with a lot of services around it, would cost a publisher a very generous 600. It's usually less than that, but a very generous $600. Uh, we also know that uh, the cost of an article from subscription to open access, if you average over all of that, have been fairly constant over the last decade or two, but somewhere between four and $5,000 in terms of revenue, US dollars. And so we took the lower bound of that, the $4,000, which is still fairly accurate uh, still today. And then we know from uh, the publishing uh, of the public publishers, <laughs> pardon the, uh, the pun, uh, how much, uh, profit they make, which is usually about 30%. So that's about $1,200. And so that means on average from all the from about 3 million articles published uh, today per year, we have about $2,200 that are not profit nor cost. Where of course then for each article and each publisher, only the publisher knows where that money actually goes. And so the question is, what do they, and that's more than half. So it's more than half of what is currently being paid. And the question is, where does that money go? And uh, some time ago, uh, Elizabeth Bick asked uh, or mentioned to uh, James and me uh, that it would be nice if they would just maybe shell out some money, use some of that money for some decent quality control. But as we just heard, it doesn't seem to be where the money is going. So where else could it be going? Well, of course, we all know they, they lobby politicians and they bribe probably a lot. There's uh, the Research Works Act. Uh, from many years ago. So they do all that kind of stuff. But what they uh, also do is they uh, do invest it in other things. But what one first can see here is that uh, 
In fact, in terms of quality, it's actually the other way around as one would think. One would think that uh, the higher you go up the journal rank ladder, the more scrutiny there is because you know one aspect of it is there's more rejection. However, in the uh, sources that I list there on the bottom, what one can see if, if one looks at methodological quality, so how well was the research done in all kinds of different fields, a summary of that is that the higher you go for journal rank, the lower the quality of the work that's being published there. And probably this, we don't know yet, but probably also the lower the replicability. At the same time, what we also know from a whole bunch of sources is that as we go up journal rank, the higher the price in terms of now in the uh, open access situation uh, of article processing charges. And so essentially what we're doing is collectively, we're paying more for less reliable research when we're using the current journal hierarchy. And of course, this is because we're not paying for quality, we're paying for prestige and prestige is what is being monetized uh, by those corporations. And so it's quite clear, and that has become clear also already by the first two speakers, Dorothy and James, is that the publishers have orthogonal interests. They don't care what they publish as long as we pay. They could publish empty sheets of paper and print them and send them out to us as long as the financials are okay. Right? The, what is being published is completely irrelevant to them because as long as we pay, why should they worry? And obviously we pay more for less quality. So it's quite clear the incentives are you should publish more lower quality work because that's where all the money is. Now, where does that money go? And that's something that has uh, come into focus recently for us as the, those that suffer from it. And that's uh, science trackings or surveillance publishing. Uh, but the publishers have been investing into tracking software and tracking technology uh, for about 10 years, which is roughly about the time when we didn't need subscriptions anymore, right? So since about 10 years, uh, there's been a gazillion different ways of coming around subscriptions. And yet, uh, we still subscribe. This is probably something that the publishers didn't anticipate, that despite not needing subscriptions, we would still be paying for them 10 years from uh, uh, 2010 or 2012 uh, ago. So uh, what they did is they, a large number of them, as you will see in a second, uh, they invested into uh, software that collects your user data and not just on their publishing platforms, but of course they buy uh, tools and, uh, uh, and software that helps you in your research workflow. So if you look here at three different major publishers, so you have Elsevier, you have Holspring, and Holspring holds both Digital Science and Spring on Nature. So I put these two together, and then you have Wiley. And if you look here, uh, this is on, so say on the y-axis, on the x-axis, you see horizontally what is actually vertical integration. You have the discovery, the workflow, right? So you have the discovery of, of uh, a research question, and then take your collect your data, analyze the data, write a paper, publish it. And this is, this is roughly the point uh, where we know the publishers used to work. So that what now are essentially ex-publishers. And then you have outreach and then assessment. And so for, let's stick with Elsevier. I can't go through all of them, but let's stick with Elsevier. So they have their Scopus database and Mendeley, their citation managers, so that they know precisely what it is that you're finding and what you want to cite. Long before, just from here, long before you start writing or analyzing, they already know what you're interested in. And then you analyze your data, you write and cite, you publish with them, then they, they have uh, solutions for outreach. And then also very prominently, they have Plum Analytics and Pure, which is licensed by a lot of uh, our employers to find out which faculty should get more money and which faculty should get less. So they're steering where the money is going uh, via these uh, analytics uh, and assessment tools. And this is the same uh, in for all of these, uh, or many of these, and the largest of these publishers. So this is where most of the money is going, essentially. It's not in quality control because they don't care about that, uh, but it's going in getting ourselves surveyed as, as completely as possible from discovery to assessment. So essentially the, the saying goes, if you're not the paying for the product, you are the product. But academics are so smart, they pay for the prestige to be the product. So uh, when everybody else outside of academia is happy to not pay for their tools, we even pay for the tools and then get surveyed. And this is also, as mentioned before, all done in the open. 
So Elsevier doesn't say that, that they're publishers anymore. They're saying that they grew from their roots in publishing and now they offer data analytics. And uh, if you look for their about page, it says Elsevier is a leader in information and analytics for customers across, across the global research and health ecosystem. And so essentially your data that you provide to them will end up in a product that tells, let's say, South Korea what they have to do to become particularly world leading in some aspect of science and beat all the competitors of which you are one, usually, if you're not in South Korea or in some other country that buys these services. And uh, Paul Abrams, the chief communications officer of Relex, told us this year that less than half of Elsevier's revenue come from academic journals. So most of their money comes from selling your data and uh, from selling and licensing these, um, um, these tools that they use to collect data and to um, influence where research uh, should be going. And how much is that? Could you wrap this up one minute, John? Sorry? One minute. Yes, yes, I'm done. I was, I was surprised there was still a slide in there. I'm, I, I still, I, I actually, I think I still have one slide in terms of solutions. So those are all problems. Uh, right. And so this is, you know, about 3 billion. And Dorothy was talking about some, some million in euro, a million dollars or euros or pounds. Now, this is 3 billion pounds for Elsevier. And if, you know, a little bit more than half means comes from science tracking, so that's 1.7 billion euros. And that's every single year that is that they're making from with our data. So essentially, academics spend billions for the privilege to serve as a corporate commodity. Right, so that's what we are doing collectively. And the solution that I would say is that uh, we should do, as people in the 90s has already said, this was uh, published in 1999, but it's a story from 1992, 1996, and no, 1993, there it was described in a meeting held by the Royal Society in 1993. So it's now a 30-year-old idea is that uh, we should maybe upgrade the way we communicate science. Journals is a concept from the 17th century. And uh, there's a reason very few people outside of academia are still founding new journals. And uh, I will post in the chat box uh, the link to uh, our long form ways of explaining how we would like to do this today. We of course wouldn't do it like they would have done it in 1993, um, but there are 10 experts here on that uh, article where we describe in more words than I have left today on how we can Take all that money that we're currently paying to become a corporate commodity and using it for something useful for academia. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We should offer like trauma support, like halfway through this. Like if these are just like hitting bottom for you for the first time, it's it's tricky to handle. So we have, um, I was gonna go until 1250 with Q&A for this section. And Bjorn, you have a question that for the citation on your cost estimate article, if you could pop that in as well. So I will try to synthesize some of the questions that are in Q&A, also encourage people to turn on their cameras and raise their hands. But my question for the panel, and please everybody chime in. So these people are, the, these academic publishers have a business model. It's a good business model, they're making a ton of money. They have no incentive to, to increase rigor, to, to hire people who are specialists in fraud detection, things like that. They're, no, they're going to do some data mining and sell it back to us. Once you get your head around these facts, they're all pretty transparent, right? Like nobody's hiding any of this. This is the published business model. What? So I don't hang out in circles of people at UKRI or whatever who are writing the checks for multi-million pounds for each university. What's the feeling for the people writing checks to pay these processing charges, to pay the subscription fees? I feel a little insular knowing all about the problems. And I wonder what's your feeling when you talk to, I don't know, people at these agencies, deans, whoever, about how bad this is. It's egregious. Bjorn, yeah. That can be my last thing that I can say. Uh, I just recently talked to someone uh, published in Nature Communications and paid 5,000 euros plus tax. And they say, oh, it's so worth it. I ask them, well, that's a lot of money, isn't it? And they say, oh, it's so worth it. So that's what they say. But it is worth it to me to publish in Nature. Jesus, promotion guaranteed, right? So absolutely worth it to spend taxpayer money to get myself a promotion by publishing in a fancy journal. But Nature can be particularly fancy. It's just, just using the name Nature. 
but that good for them, right? They figured they can spawn 150 nature journals and all of our bosses will be fooled and we'll pay the fee and we'll get promoted. What, who's writing the checks for these, all of these APCs? I mean, I've, I've been talking to um, academic li librarians a bit and they don't like paying these fees. They don't want to pay these fees. It's all coming out of their budgets. Uh, but they feel compelled to do so because they're being told by academics, you know, we need to access this journal, we need to be able to publish here. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, there needs to be a viable alternative before we can, we can uh, and they feel stuck by that. The librarians are paying the fees. I know they're cross about it, as they should be. But I wonder about, there's no magic man on a throne at UKRI, but they're writing the checks that pay these APCs, no? Or Welcome Trust or wherever. Well, uh, some sometimes, quite quite a lot of the time, there are uh, university wide or sometimes national specific schemes that are providing the money for this. So a lot of the time, these things are quite heavily comped. Um, they're not paid. Certainly, they're not paid by individual researchers. Um, a lot of the time, they're paid out of grant loans, and that money has been specifically recouped from the government in the first place. That's then later then slotted in. Um, Sometimes I've heard of conversations with people where they go, well, we got an extra $25,000 for publication costs from the government, but we haven't spent it because we've, we've, we've sent it elsewhere. I hope it's okay if we redirect it in the budget to something else. Um, the uh, One more thing when we're talking about money, which is something I have to do all day now. If you talk to people who are within the publication industry themselves who are that chain, they have a completely different language, understanding, lexicon, view, everything to what we're talking about. They, this is, even now, even given the fact that uh, I'm referencing things from the 1960s and Bjorn's referencing things from the early 1990s, um, these, are, these are not new ideas. We're talking more about the, uh, the change in the trajectory of old ideas. And... The people who are actually managing the elements of the companies for how they stick together are completely walled off from the vast majority of this. This is not they are. They, th they think of similar and overlapping issues in completely different terms. They don't really know a lot of what we're talking about happening. And if you ever bring the heat in a conversation with them, the response of, in general is, why are you being so mean to me? At least that's the centre of my experience. Dorothy's put a hand up. Wait a minute. I just am seeing, sorry, I did not see where I could see hands. I think David Reinstein had his hand up. David, do you want to come in? Allowed to talk. Sorry, I didn't know I had to allow to talk. Hi. Good there morning. You go. hear you. Here in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, New York, actually. Sorry, it's very early. Um, I, I just wanted to, and I guess maybe this is a little bit more towards the, the second part of the, of the, you know, of, the, of this of this talk, but, or this conference meeting is the word I'm looking for. Sorry, the coffee hasn't come in yet. But basically, I want to get your thoughts on this anyways. I mean, the discussion seems to assume, and I'm, I'm reading from my written com comment here, the discussion seems to assume that when a paper gets into a, maybe implicitly assume when a paper gets into a journal, it then has value, it has influence, you know, it, it, it gets people tenure and, and, on the, and on the other side of the coin, it, it influences science decisions that policymakers and scientists make. But aren't we moving to, I mean, we can now, and in, in some fields like, like economics, people put all their work up on the web. You can publish yourself. Obviously, publishing is antiquated. Aren't we moving to a world where research credibility is based on ha having positive proof and rating of, of your work? In other words, demonstrating that it is uh, valuable. And there are several, this is a little bit of a plug, but there's several projects in that area, and I want to know what you thought of them. Uh, one of them is eLife's published and review model. Another, which is the one that I'm involved in, is the UnJournal, where essentially we just pay, um, we pay evaluators to, eva we, to evaluate work and give it a rating. And, you know, that kind of makes the idea that, that publication is the target a bit obsolete. And why isn't that a solution? In other words, and why should we then focus on what's, what I think is perhaps the, 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 antediluvian or whatever you want to say model 
Um, what do you think about this? And what do you see as the key blockers to this? We've tried to anticipate, we're trying to anticipate blockers to this. So I, I agree there are many options for us to make our work public. I would disagree with the idea that the powers that be who are quickly evaluating our papers put much stock at all in a in a comment left under a, a, a preprint on the internet. So well, it, it's not. I mean, sorry, I'm jumping on top of you, but just, just if you look at these models, it's not a it's not a comment. It will be a DOI. the The responses will be DOI publications in themselves. Um, and but okay, go on. But that's a very good point. And I'll, I'll let you continue. Sorry for talking over you. Any panelists want to respond to David? Dorothy. Dorothy. <laughs> Um, it's, it, it is related to what's gone before as well as to what went before that. I think we've got a very narrow focus here if we're just only talking about sort of um, Western countries. Um, so the paper mill model is largely supported by China, Iran, Russia, um, where, you know, the, the notion that it doesn't matter where you, it, 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 it actually doesn't matter where you publish. All that matters is that you have published. Um, the money that comes to pay for these, people were saying, oh, individuals don't pay for it. In some cases they do uh, because they need to advance their careers and it's for relatively cheap relative to some of the other things they may have to pay for. If you want to become a doctor in a Chinese hospital, a publication is required, or it was. I think they're changing that now. They, just, um, they are, yes. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the, uh, and a lot of institutions will pay because they want their rankings to go up on some one of these multifarious scales that institutions get rated on. Um, so, I mean, it's all totally corrupt. It's all totally wrong. I mean, I quite agree with David. I've been, I mean, I've been arguing for that sort of thing for 10 years, but it's just it's like right, trying to turn around an enormous ship. Um, and I think, you know, people who are sort of been pushing for this uh, sometimes underestimate the uh, drag on the enormous ship that's coming, not just um, from their colleagues. But if you look at it as a worldwide thing where there's many, many people from different cultures involved, um, we really probably need to be putting more efforts into communicating with people in many different cultures uh, to make it clear that that sort of approach to just publishing as much as you possibly can and never mind the quality, feel the width, you know, isn't, isn't a sensible way forward. But it, it really is embedded deeply in some places. Uh, and people are quite shocked at the idea that, it, you know, a paper mill paper wouldn't, wouldn't count for anything. So on that note, I'm going to move us on to constructive actions here and hopefully leave even more time at the end um, for more q and I encourage panelists, if you'd like, to take a look. We have some questions in the Q&A section that folks can answer. So without further ado, to start the second half with concrete suggestions, we have Dan Goodman, Senior Lecturer in Engineering at Imperial College London. I know Dan from his Neural Reckoning Twitter handle and Mastodon. Um, Dan, I first got to know your name about a year ago you wrote, you posted, basically suggesting, saying that you had stepped down from editorial boards, from all editorial boards, I think from commercial publishers, and stopped doing post-publication peer review. And that's my favorite kind of political activism, just like stop and doing stuff, right? So you think that the right thing for us to do may to be withdraw some services here. And it seems so astonishing for an academic to say it out loud. And it seems so naughty and like, we're sort of not allowed to do this but we absolutely are. So uh, with that, I turn it over to you, Dan, on the end of standard peer review. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I thought I would start my slide with a nice peaceful background scene from Hampstead Heath of, uh, of some swans in, in, the, in the mist because uh, I need some peace before talking about peer review. It gets me a bit, a bit heated up. Um, so I thought I would just quickly start actually with, with my story because I think um, I'm, I'm more of a newbie to this area perhaps than some of the other speakers uh, on this panel. So I think like all scientists, um, I originally just accepted peer review as a sort of fact of life, background fact about the universe. And of course, like all scientists, I like to, to gripe about it um, because that's, that's what we do as scientists. 
Um, around December 2020, I started as a reviewing editor at eLife. And this was kind of my dream editorial role because eLife is a journal that I saw as one that's trying to actually change things. Um, and it is a great journal and I'm still very much supportive of it. But despite that, I immediately, almost immediately started to sort of have doubts rising about that role of editor and reviewer. Um, specifically, I felt like we were making decisions that were too rushed and not fully enough informed. And that even knowing that we didn't have enough time to do it better than we were doing. Um, around this sort of time, about a year later than that, I started a new project, uh, which was sort of internally called Neuromatch Journal. Neuromatch is an organization for computational neuroscience that I started uh, at the start of the pandemic. Um, and we were basically thinking about how we could do it better. Um, so that was, that was Neuromatch Journal. And as part of the, the thinking about how we could do it better, um, I sort of eventually came to the opinion that uh, there's unavoidable issues with pre-publication peer review. So that's the, what we do at the moment. That is peer review before the paper gets published. Um, and I thought that those were unavoidable. And so I therefore decided to uh, resign, as, as Jess said, resign all my editorial roles uh, and, and stop doing any pre-publication peer review. Um, so I, uh, as just said, I, I announced that on Twitter, um, in retrospect, perhaps perhaps a mistake. There was a, a rather angry vocal minority, um, and, and you can see some of the, some of their comments there, um, some slightly threatening tone to some of them. Um, but despite that there being a small vocal minority of people who were very angry about this, overwhelmingly, what I saw was a massive flood of support for, for, for this idea. Um, so this, this, you know, this got a lot of engagement. A lot of people have privately contacted me to talk about this. Um, it's, it seems that it, it sort of hit a nerve uh, and that people feel, feel quite strongly about this. Okay, um, so the, the last bit of my story, and I'll finish my, my talk with this as well, which is that we uh, decided not to do Neuromatch Journal because we decided that we shouldn't be doing a journal at all. Uh, and, and we've switched our efforts to doing something which at the moment is called Neuromatch Open Publishing. You can go and take a look at this on this website here at nmop.io, uh, and I will talk a little bit about it towards the end of this uh, brief presentation. Okay, so uh, I want this to be positive, but first I have to just say a little bit about uh, what I think is, is wrong before I can say how we how we can how I think we can do it better. And this is all like very much personal opinion. So what's wrong with um, peer review? Well, first of all, I think it fails on its own um, uh, on its own criteria. It doesn't catch all of the errors, the, the sort of, in terms of evaluating technical correctness, it doesn't catch all of the errors. Uh, and, it, and it can't, right? Because, you know, there's only a handful of reviewers. They're not necessarily very well matched to, to the problem. And also, if there's an error that's found after publication, then that can't be reflected in pre-publication uh, peer review. Uh, and, and hence the, the necessity for all of these other services like PubPeer and so on. Um, and because we have all of these uh, incentives to get published, uh, it actually gives, uh, and the, this peer review is, is, is a time limited thing, it gives authors an incentive to try and hide the problems as well. Um, so it actually makes it more difficult to find the errors doing, doing peer review this way. Um, so it also fails on, on, on its uh, ability to evaluate significance. Um, so uh, this is a, another sort of function of peer review. And I don't think we, really can evaluate significance. Ultimately, the only thing that determines whether a paper is significant is whether or not it influences things over the, the decades that follow. Um, so what we end up doing when we try to evaluate significance is largely introduced by us. We uh, might have certain preferred topics, certain preferred authors, certain preferred institutions, certain preferred methods, uh, and we do a lot of gatekeeping. So, so a lot of what we're doing when we say we're evaluating significance is just introducing uh, bias. It also has, I think, a mental health cost, uh, peer review done this way. Um, it's part of a, a sort of culture of overwork. And you hear a lot of people complaining about how they have to do all of their reviewing and editorial work on the evenings and at weekends. Um, and, and, there's a, and, and that's because it's not something that is rewarded in the academic system. So they have to do it in, in their spare time um, out of it. It also introduces, because there's an, a rather random element to peer review, it creates a lot of, um, sort of career variance. Right, you. If you get a big paper in Nature, your career is set. If you don't get that big paper in Nature, you you might end up in a completely different country, a completely different university. You might have to leave academia. So, 
I, I think that sort of uncertainty um, is also very problematic and, and makes uh, makes makes science a very challenging er, um, sort of field to work in in terms of mental health. Uh, and of course, it's wasteful. Um, so the, the, there's huge publication delays. Um, when reviewers at a particular high-profile journal make demands, you feel like you have to respond to them even if they don't really make sense. Um, I, I've had papers that have been in review for years, and a lot of that time was spent responding to reviewer requests that I didn't think needed to be actually responded to. Uh, and, I, and I think that's not an unusual uh, state of affairs. And all of those reviews are wasted if the paper is ultimately rejected. And of course, as, as we all know, there's massive financial costs as well. Okay, so what's the alternative? Uh, well, I'm going to say two things about that. I, I think it starts with just instead of doing pre-publication peer review, switching to post-publication peer review. Uh, and, and why I think this is a good way of doing it is because where does really our um, sense that science works come from? It doesn't come from the fact that we have two people read the paper before it gets published. It comes from the fact that there's a whole bunch of people who basically will see something that they don't agree with and try their best to destroy it. And ultimately, if they either manage to show that that, that, that theory being proposed was wrong, or they find that, um, uh, uh, that actually, yes, the data do support this and, and, and they change their mind. So basically, the, the real meat of what makes science work happens after the paper is published, not before. Um, and it also comes with a host of other benefits. So first of all, there's no delays. This speeds up science. It's good for people's careers. Uh, you get some of that from preprints, uh, of course. Um, it also allows us to focus our efforts on the most Im impactful papers. Um, a lot of papers um, get cited very little or, or not at all. Um, and we put as much effort into reviewing those as something that is that may shape the, 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 the direction of the field for years. Something that is getting hundreds of thousands of citations probably ought to be reviewed a lot more in depth than something that basically never gets cited. So we could better use our resources by, by doing post-publication peer review. We can, of course, find errors at any time under post-publication peer review. There's a larger pool of potentially better matched reviewers. Those better matched reviewers are people who read the paper and care about what it says, um, not necessarily the people the editor could, uh, could find and agree to, to review it. And I think it also reduces the incentives to hide the problems and puts the author in control, which is also good things. But I don't think post-publication peer review is enough. Uh, I think we have to take it further. And we think, what about, what, what is the goal of doing peer review? Well, I, I think that there's various things we could do. We could talk about the fact that peer review gives feedback to the authors and that it provides in a way a certain sort of context um, to other readers. Uh, and I think those are the things that we should be focusing on in a replacement uh, sort of system. Um, so by feedback, I mean that's feedback from the readers to the authors of, of the original work. So that might be finding mistakes that could be just very small mistakes, or it could be more fundamental things, maybe suggesting changes. Um, and you know, one of the things we might want to experiment with is if someone has contributed a lot to a paper by, by, by these sort of suggestions that they could even get added to the paper as an author, which is not something we do under the current uh, peer review model. And there's also providing context. Um, so in a way, which, which journal a paper gets published in is a certain form of context, right? It's saying that this is interest to the, uh, uh, this is of this paper is of interest to the readership of this journal. But we can have a much richer form of context by, uh, by, by having arbitrary comments attached to articles. Um, and, and yeah, and, and some journals are already starting to, to show the peer review, but this could be an ongoing process. So basically this allows us to provide additional information to readers helps us evaluate the work. And it can be critical uh, as peer review often is, but it can also be positive. For example, like you, you might have someone say, um, oh, the authors haven't realized that actually this problem that they've solved also solves this problem in this other field, right? Uh, and that's really useful context for people uh, reading it uh, and helps the authors and, and, and another positive thing to say. Uh, and there can also be other things under that like commentary to make the paper easier to understand and so forth. Okay, so that, that's my kind of my view of what I think uh, are, are important things, but I don't think that that's the only possible view. I think what we want to do is to try out a bunch of different approaches about what sort of peer review, what sort of feedback uh, is useful. Um, and to do that, we have to reduce the cost of experimenting with those things. Uh, because at the moment, it's that's hugely expensive, starting up a new journal or, or trying a new approach, not just in, in terms of cost, but in terms of organizational effort to try and get people to take part in it is, is, is massive. So that's 
brings me on to my final point, because that's basically what we want to do with uh, Neuromatch Open Publishing. Um, this is something, by the way, that will change name fairly soon. Um, it's not quite 100% decided what the new name will be, but it won't have Neuromatch in the, in the title because uh, it's going to be a separate organization. What we want to do is have a sort of end-to-end -end publishing system that is commonly owned. So um, owned and managed at, at the start, at least, by university libraries. Um, and the idea here is basically this guarantees that this will never be sold for profit and it keeps it rooted in the communities it's trying to serve. Uh, everything, of course, should be, uh, I think, free to, to read and publish. Um, and all of the, 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 the data, I mean, the, the text of the articles and everything should be uh, sort of open and reusable. And one of the things that we want to, to really build on this is that this should be a sort of infrastructure that enables people to do experiments much more easily um, than they're able to do at the moment. A minute uh, there, Dan. OK, brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm basically done, uh, other than to say um, we're, we're, we're actively seeking funding for this. We'd like to start building it as soon as we can. So if you've got a, a couple of million burning a hole in your pocket, please, uh, please do get in touch. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's all for me for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a shout out to James, who I've been trying to tag Wilston in the chat. We we can't get, and Wendy, if she's still on, the attendees can't see the Q&A or the chat very well, or they don't have access to the chat. So I've flagged him. I think he's not actually listening. We'll see if we can get it sorted. Um, otherwise, it looks like Dan is moving questions over to chat so everyone can see them. So sorry about that. Um, so I love Dan's point, like, and I actually would like, if anyone wants to chat in the chat about whether they've thought about stepping down and if they've, does your, do your promotion criteria include like, who do you peer review for? How much have you peer reviewed? Mine don't at all. So I've had no pushback at all. Um, so our next speaker, Chris Chambers. Chris, I just Googled your title right now and it's literally head of brain stimulation at the University of Cardiff, which is like the best title I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, I was thinking about how I think of you and I think of you as the king of actually getting shit done. Um, so Chris has basically switched his, you know, intellectual and academic focus towards moving towards a improving research culture and, and open science. So he'll basically created and popularized registered reports, which I think are the only reason to, to peer review before publication. Um, but anyway, hopefully Chris will tell us more about preprints and community publishing. Over to you. Thanks, Jess. Right, I'm just sharing my screen. Can you see these slides? Yep, looks great. Super. Right, so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you all about um, ways we can use preprints and combine them with peer review in a way which takes back um, a lot of agency and a lot of control of the review process from publishers. We've talked a lot in this session about uh, the damage that profit-making publishers do to academia and to science. And the overriding point I'm going to make today is that in order to dismantle that power structure, the first thing we need to do is to secure control of the entire review process and do it ourselves, because that is the hook upon which everything else lands. Now, I'm going to do this through the medium of registered reports. This is not really a talk about registered reports, um, but I'm going to use it as an example because the registered reports article type is one in which we've created this uh, pre-print format quite successfully. And this is going to, in many ways, it's a, it's a good that I'm um, following Dan, actually, because um, this is going to very much follow the same kind of ethos that we need to really completely re reinvent the system. My approach here isn't quite as um, ambitious as Dan's out, out of the gate. Um, it's more incremental. And you can, you'll be, it's, hopefully those of you watching this will, um, will gain something from looking at the differences between the approaches. Now, just for those who don't know what a registered report is, I need to explain it quickly. So a registered report is a type of article which we established about 10 years ago, which seeks to eliminate various kinds of bias in the peer review process and the publishing process. Uh, and it does that by performing peer review before uh, authors actually do their research. So peer review happens in two stages, initially at a protocol stage where reviewers assess the quality of a study proposal, and then the journal uh, performs and manages this peer review process. If review goes well, then the article is accepted in principle, regardless of the outcome. So the idea here is that the results of the research will have no effect on the publication decision. So we eliminate reporting bias and publication bias. 
Now, it's viewed within the journal landscape. It's fairly successful so far. It's been launched by about 350 different journals, and it's been launched at Nature in the last couple of months. And the impacts are promising. I'm not going to go into these in detail. Suffice it to say, it is working to eliminate bias. It is working to improve reproducibility. It is working in engaging the early career researcher community, and it is working in terms of ensuring visibility of this type of article. But it has a lot of problems, and those problems can be summarized under five major categories. First is which that the stage one review time, the time it takes um, authors to go through this pre-study evaluation can go for several months and can have an uncertain outcome. And this can be difficult to slot into the often very tight time frame of academic life. As it exists now, registered reports is limited to one journal at a time, just like with regular articles going to journals, one, one after another. If you get rejected, you go to the next and so on down the sequential chain. It's not well suited to the kind of programmatic research that characterizes so many fields in which you might have one overall kind of protocol or programmatic plan for a piece of research, um, which in theory should lead to multiple stage two outputs or final completed registered reports. But at the moment, um, the format is limited to a kind of one-to-one -one model. There's various inconsistencies in the editorial standards. So as the format has, has gained in prominence and gained in uh, um, uh, visibility across the sciences, I've noticed that the standard of editing has, has also become a little bit uh, shaky at times. And this is because um, many editors are not really well trained in evaluating uh, research before it's been done, doing specific design review, really thinking deeply about issues of theory and methodology rather than getting distracted by shiny things of results. But the most important one for today, the most important limitation of the journal-based registered reports model is the fact that just like every other journal article type, the peer review and the publication process is controlled virtually entirely by academic publishers. Now, we do the work but they get the reward, okay? And most of these publishers, as we've discussed, are commercial, banking huge profits at our expense. And so we're basically uh, performing a huge amount of labor and we're not benefiting from it at all. And that's why in 2021, we created the peer community in registered reports. Now, some of you may be familiar with the, the broader peer community in project, which is a very large scale, very impressive um, uh, program in which um, there's a number of different communities across different fields which perform um, peer review at the preprint stage prior to journal submission free in a free non-commercial platform. Now, we created a peer community for registered reports specifically across all fields. And the idea here is to take the regular registered reports review process that you might get at a journal and just do that at an earlier stage before journal submission. Okay. And once authors go through this uh, uh, review process, this review of the preprint stage, uh, the submission is recommended by the peer community in registered reports and the revised manuscript or the revised preprint um, is posted on a preprint server along with the peer reviews and an editorial recommendation, which is a short kind of blurb, a, a synopsis of the research and why it, why it was uh, awarded in principal acceptance or stage two acceptance. And then at the end of this process, authors have the option to take their preprint and just leave it there with its own DOI. It's a piece of peer reviewed science um, uh, that's on par with anything else out there. Or they can uh, take it to a traditional journal if they need that. So they can go to a, any journal that they want, if they want to propose it to a journal. But there's also a list of PCI registered reports friendly journals um, that we have on board, which have committed to accepting the recommendations of the PCI registered reports uh, review process without further peer review. So these journals have essentially committed to replacing their own internally managed review process with one by us, by peer community and registered reports. And when I say us, I really mean us because it's us, the community who are doing everything. We do the peer review regardless of whether it's through a journal or whether it's managed by peer community and registered reports. We do most of the editing. Um, we're basically, we are peer review. So there's an absolutely no reason why it needs to be managed by a publisher. Here's a schematic of how the process works. So you begin by submitting your uh, registered report to PCIRR as a private or public URL. So you can be a public preprint or it can be a, an embargoed uh, stage one submission. This goes through the stage one 
view process here where it go it can be uh it's evaluated at desk it can then be peer reviewed and revised just like you would normally do with a any kind of registered report um, and then it gets a stage one recommendation in which case um, a public or private recommendation is posted on the registered reports uh, website at pci then authors go away and do the research and when they're finished they come back with an updated preprint which is now a stage two submission Okay, and this gets uh, reassessed by the same recommender and reviewers and then recommended at the end. It's now a valid, citable article um, with its own DOI. It's just been peer reviewed before any journal has ever touched it. And then, as I say, authors have this option to submit to a PCI registered reports friendly journal where it will be accepted without further peer review. Here's just some of the journals, uh, an example of some of the journals which are PCI registered reports friendly in my field. Um, they cut across quite a broad range of uh, psychology and neuroscience journals at the moment, and, and there's more jo joining all the time. And there's also these PCI registered reports interested journals over here, which don't automatically endorse um, the uh, recommendations of the peer community and registered reports initiative, but they do keep a close eye on submissions and they often make offers to authors. So it gives authors all of this control to decide the fate of their article uh, by simply taking control of that review process ourselves as a community and doing that through a preprint process. There are some other features that we've been able to build in. And I think one of the aspects we haven't really talked about in this session so far is the extent to which um, the, the dominance of academic publishers puts the brakes on innovation. Uh, publishers manage peer review using clunky 1990s software, which really um, makes a huge amount of money for them, but is not very good and not very flexible and not very dynamic and is very expensive. And we can take the, uh, the opportunity by creating this initiative, the PCI Registered Reports Initiative, to build in additional innovations, such as programmatic registered reports, where one stage one preprint can lead to multiple stage two outputs. So you can have a program of work. Uh, which which then forks out to become multiple uh, registered reports, all with one review process. And perhaps the most important innovation, the one that's really working very nicely and is very popular, is scheduled review, where we eliminate that stage one review time almost entirely by performing peer review in a, in a planned manner. So authors initially submit a stage one snapshot which before they've even started writing their manuscript, and then the recommender lines up the peer review process for the future in about six to eight weeks' time. And so when you do that, you actually perform a lot of the key um, aspects of peer review in parallel. Um, the review process can be done very quickly at the point that the manuscript is submitted. I don't want to use up all my time, so I'm going to skip this bit, but the slides are publicly available. It gives you a ex working example of how you can use this um, platform to if you combine the schedule track and the programmatic track to get an entire PhD peer reviewed at the outset and all your papers accepted before you collect your first data point. But I'll leave that, there's a temptation to look at later in the slides. And there's more information here about PCI. Um, there's lots of submissions coming in and it's a very interdisciplinary initiative. So we welcome submissions, we welcome adopting journals, but I hope that mo most of all, I hope it gets us all thinking about the fact that we don't need to rely and we shouldn't be relying on commercial academic publishers for managing peer review in whatever form it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, bang on time. I think this is the answer. I think registered reports peer review before you start your damn study is the natural right thing to do for science. I do think it's hard to pitch. It's hard to get the rewards for working to this this better standard. It's hard to get the powers that be. Their brains just like short circuit when you give them like a, a four forward title. But so we have one more speaker. It's Lizzie Gad who couldn't be here due to a scheduling conflict. She might make the, the q and I'm conscious that despite being a savage about trying to keep time, we're going to hit our 90 minutes at the end of Lizzie's uh, pre-recorded talk, which I have here 10 minutes bang on. So if the panelists wouldn't mind staying an extra maybe five or 10 minutes to take a few questions, that would be great. I understand if some of the participants have to leave, um, but I will share Lizzie's talk. It's a segue from Chris's. So Lizzie is, hang on one sec, research policy manager at Loughborough University, coming from a career in academic libraries. So she's different than the rest of the panelists. She's been pushing for things like open access policies for her whole career. I know her, she did a secondment at Glasgow as the head of research culture. Um, and so her work has been in trying to change how we get assessed for our research. I can highly recommend 
the Harnessing the Metric Tide report. They make some pretty bold recommendations. This was a report funded by the UKRI, them who fund all of us, about how they should change, how they assess us for RAF. So I'll pop a link in there. I am going to try to share Lizzie's recording here. Can one of the panelists, I'm gonna start it right now, tell me that they can hear her talking? I can see the slides. Yeah, I can't Last. hear the audio. I can't hear. Um, okay, so I am sharing, I'm gonna see if this helps. Yes, all good now. I've lost the audio again. I don't know if it's coming through for anyone else. Nope, can't hear it. Nobody can hear it. For yeah, you, yeah. that's what the raised hands are about. Okay. Um, I don't know. So I'm just playing it on my laptop. Are you all picking it up through the computer mic? It's not being like broadcast. Mm. I was picking it up earlier, but I can't hear it anymore. Okay. I'm going to try one more second. If this doesn't work, I'm going to post a link to the metric tide and we'll open up the Q&A. Okay. Um, my apologies. Lizzie's talk was the talk I was most excited for, right? She's doing God's work. She's trying to change the way RAF grades our research. Um, it's a disappointment. So this talk is being recorded. I'm also going to figure out how to circulate Lizzie's pre-recorded talk with this and post a link to the metric tide. Basically, all the great ideas in the world about how to change where we post our preprints and our, our peer review don't matter if the powers that be don't reward us for working that way. So my latest thing is like, I'm not joking when I say I think we should try to plant students in low level jobs at UKRI. Like it's time we infiltrate the funders and that that's our political activism as well. You're like, my friend, no research career for you, off to the funder. You have to help us get, get these things rewarded. Um, so harnessing the metric tide does not recommend planting spies at UKRI, but I think there's nothing wrong with thinking along that that chain, how are we influencing people who hold the purses? Um, okay, let me gather my wit and look at the Q&A. Um, Jess, there's a comment that you might need to just share the audio from Zoom. Share the audio from Zoom. I think if you go to share screen yeah. and you go to advanced, I'm not sure if that's exactly how to do it, but I was just poking around and I could see that there's a computer audio option. I don't know if that might work in solving your problem. All I can see is who can share and who can start sharing when someone else is sharing. When, when you hit the share screen button, yeah, the, so I, for me, it's a share sound as a thing you can tick. So it might be that. I'm doing, oh. Share <laughs> screen and then share that, audio. That'll do it. Okay, how many PhDs is, does it take? Okay, I'm gonna try again. Share sound. Thank you, Chris and Dan. Hello, my name is Lizzie Gadd. I work at Loughborough University in the UK. I also chair the International Network of Research Management Societies, INORMS Research Evaluation Group, and I'm a vice chair of the Coalition on Advancing Research Assessment. And I've taken as my title today, Can Research Assessment Reform Fix Journals? Okay, so what's the problem with journals? Well, as I'm the last speaker of six, I'm hoping the problem will be very clear to you by now. Uh, but essentially, our problem really boils down to the fact that academic career assessment is so publication centric. So here's a result of a survey done by the European University Association uh, back in 2019, which asked researchers which of their activities were the most important. 
and you can see, uh, surprise, surprise, the runaway winner was research publications, with 80% saying this was very important to their careers. And of course, it's not just any type of publication that matters to careers, but journal articles. And this data is a bit old, but it shows the increase in journal article submissions, the red bars, to three successive iterations of the UK research assessment exercise, where journal output increased exercise after exercise, even in the humanities. And of course, when we say researchers are assessed by journal articles, we really mean the journals in which they are published and not the articles themselves. This forms then a negative feedback loop where journal brand obsession leads to researchers seeking to put their best work in a very small number of journals, which because they contain everyone's best work, then get very highly cited, leading all parties to believe that these are somehow inherently better journals. But of course, a journal is only as good as the work that goes into it and the editorial board that gets attracted to work at it. Meanwhile, the journal takes credit for being such a highly cited journal and article processing charges for those journals go through the roof, largely in line with their journal impact factor. Uh, as this data from Heather Morrison shows, where highly cited journals have higher APCs than those that are less well cited. So how might assessment reform help? Well, it'll come as no surprise that there have been a significant number of calls in recent years for research assessment reform. We had DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment in 2012, essentially a backlash against the use of the journal impact factor to assess individual researchers or articles. Then we had the Leiden Manifesto in 2015, which is 10 principles for the responsible use of bibliometrics across a range of evaluative settings. We had the Metric Tide Report a couple of months later, which had five principles for the use of all research metrics, which were updated with the publication of the Harnessing the Metric Tide Report last year. In 2019, we gained the Hong Kong principles for researcher assessment that are based around research integrity. And in 2022, the European University Association and Science Europe established a coalition to develop the agreement on reforming research assessment. So how might these reforms help us with scholarly communication reform? Well, lots of ways, but I've only got 10 minutes. So I'm going to focus on three. The first of which is to require the community to value a broader range of things, not just publications. All well and good. But the challenge with measuring what matters, of course, is actually measuring what matters, given that we don't actually have a lot of alternatives to publication data right now for assessing those broader contributions. That's why one of the harnessing the metric tide recommendations was to undertake a community led piece of work to identify things we do actually care about with a view to providing alternatives. But of course, once we agree on alternatives, we must give them equal or greater weight than the legacy indicators. There's no point measuring what matters if we're still heavily weighting the things that don't. One of the specific things research assessment reforms say we need to think about more broadly is our outputs themselves. We need to broaden our perspective as to which outputs count, so practice-based outputs, software, protocols, etc. And what are the dimensions of them that count? Do they adhere to standards? Was data made available, etc.? This makes absolute sense, but we do have to be careful that this doesn't drive us back to the journal literature as a source of metadata for the things that we do care about, thus still tying us to journals, but in a different way. So this piece in the Scholarly Kitchen argued that the journal article should be the fundamental unit of data sharing. But of course, that wouldn't allow for data to become a standalone unit of scholarship and would embed journal articles as the accounting unit of scholarship forever. We're already starting to see journal metadata used to develop open science indicators, again, something we care about. 
And of course, with more journals taking up the contributor role taxonomy credit to surface those broader contributions, again, that we care about, it's not unreasonable to predict uh, this being packaged up and sold back to us in a future SciVal module. So yes to valuing a broader range of outputs and output qualities, but beware that this doesn't send us back to journals as a sort of data uh, about the broader things we care about. And finally, a third key message of research assessment reform is to value the content not the container. And I think this is the message that gives us the greatest hope for scholarly communication reform, as I'll explain in a moment. But it's not just the content of the output that I think we need to value, but the content of the peer review. And I think if we start to see peer review as content and to make it as visible and valued as the output content, this will take us a long way. So I'm going to leave uh, you with um, three suggested paradigm shifts in research assessment that I think will really help us here to fix the scholarly record. And the first thing is a shift from summative to formative output assessment. We need to shift from scholarly communication, that is unidirectional scholarship for glory fanfaring, to scholarly conversation, where the purpose of publication is to enter into scholarly dialogue with peers about the research itself. Because if publication became about the peer review and there was no glory in getting published, but only in the feedback that resulted, we'd fix so many of the problems that we've heard about today. There'd be no point to paper mills because there would be no economic basis for them if there's no reward for publishing other than a peer review report. And guest ghost or gift authorship would become a thing of the past because if researchers only published to communicate with their peers and to get feedback rather than for glory and the concomitant financial rewards, a gift authorship suddenly doesn't feel so much like a gift. The second paradigm shift that would change the world of scholarly communication overnight is taking EDI seriously. I mean, really seriously, because I hate to say it, but publishing in venues that are only open to wealthy scholars, which will largely be in the global north, is turning a blind eye to structural racism. And yes, that includes those journals that make provision for poor scholars to beg for a waiver. Publishing in venues that are not representative of the scholars working in those fields is equally problematic. Behold, if you will, the names of the editors in the top 49 economics journals from the Australian Business Dean's Council list. I think it speaks for itself. The databases that we use to define our scholarly record are also hugely inequitable. So this data shows the percentage of journals indexed in Scopus that are from the Global North, 81%, relative to the Global South, 18.4%. How fair is that? And that's before we get on to the use of this publication data in all forms of assessment, which just privileges the privileged, both at the level of the individual scholar, as with this, but also at national level, as this data is sucked up by the university rankings and used as lazy shortcuts to identify institutional quality, in this case here, to identify who qualifies for high potential individual visas. And I believe that if we took our EDI, our equity, diversity and inclusion policies to their natural extension and said, actually, because we care about equity, we can no longer, in all good faith, publish in journals with APCs and no longer publish in journals that all have white middle aged men as editors in chief and no longer take Scopus or base our publication assessments on SciVal or engage with the university rankings that would really be world changing. And my final paradigm shift in research assessment that would change the world of scholarly communication forever would be simply global agreement as to how we're going to do it better. Because research is global and scholars are mobile and effective research assessment reform therefore also needs global buy-in. 
or as our Dutch colleagues have already found, efforts to do better are going to meet with considerable resistance. Because the truth is that the initiatives that have gained the most traction in the responsible research assessment space and the SCOLCOM space vary in global take up. And whilst they might be global in name, they're largely led by the global north. And whilst the intentions are all good, we have to be sensitive to this and I think learn better ways of more equitable global engagement if we're really going to reach agreement about a better way of doing and rewarding scholarship. My time is up. Thank you very much for listening. Do find me on email or Twitter if you want to chat about these things. Thank you. So that brings us basically a little over time. If everyone's okay, I thought I'd take questions until 1.45 um, from the audience and from myself. Um, my first thought is that I think we've come so far. I've learned so much. I, I think as a group, progress has been made fairly quickly in the last maybe five-ish years. I feel there's a demise of science Twitter. I, I, it, it, I see a demise of science Twitter from, from what I'm watching. I don't see it picking up as strongly in Mastodon, even though that's a nice place to be. And I encourage everyone to share their handles. How do we stay in touch? So how do we people immersed in this sort of thinking, trying very hard to make changes locally, share news about policy changes, share news about job opportunities, share news about new, new progress. I do feel like discovery will be the new problem just as we all start our own journals, we all start our own metadata scraping tools. What do panel members think about that? Um, <clears throat> social networks are incredibly annoying. Um, they, once, once they achieve a sort of critical mass is really the, the only time they get to work in the first place. And watching, watching one essentially getting ruined from the top down is intensely frustrating because things like this invariably get lost. Um, I, I am honestly, I am waiting for something else that is similar within this ecosystem that has the same kind of traction as um, some of the like the initial offerings and the, the really big networks. And if I had to hazard a guess, um, there's been a lot of talk of interoperable uh, social networks in the last year or so. I mean, especially uh, given that they're, they're, they're all um, suffering from some pretty interesting business and uptake problems in different ways. Um, I think the short and unfortunate answer to that is um, we have to wait until the landscape of that changes because there are communities everywhere that have been not destroyed as much as the, 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 the social network only really works when people who have no inherent interest in the thing itself are participating because they because they have to um, when they when they start to have network effects. Um, there will be something else that replaces the present ones um, that are in the process of destroying the network effects. Um, it's going to be dependent on. It's going to be dependent on the technology. Um, it's very difficult to build one from scratch. I'm sure. I'm absolutely certain someone's had an idea somewhere about let's build a global network of sciences. Let's go. Come on, it'll be fun. Um, it rarely works. It rarely works. Um, it just as a business model in, in general, it, so many competitor products have been tried. Um, you have to wait for social contagion to happen and then catch it, unfortunately, is my um, rather bleak answer. Chris, how are you keeping track of people? How are you pushing pushing at editors, pushing it at, at, at you know provosts and stuff? Sorry, was that to me? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a number of levers here. Uh, it's great to try new things, but it's really important. One of the lessons I've learned is that it's much easier to combine our strengths. So, for example, when um, we, we had this idea of registered reports 10 years ago, um, it was thought that perhaps we could we could do that in some way separate from journals right at the outset. And I thought, 
that's pointless. It's a great idea, but it'll never work. No one will use it. So we used the infrastructure of publishers to build it and to give it a reputation and to make sure it was mainstream. And then we took it away. But then we didn't just start out and scratch. We actually joined the Peer Community In Initiative, which had already been going for five years and had 14 communities. And we just became another one. So we, we, gain, we gained from the where work as well. I think there's a, a lot of the time these sorts of reforms come and go. They, they, they sort of spark, the sparks go out because there's too many, too much reinventing of the wheel. And it's kind of like that classic XKD, XKCD cartoon, you know, where there's 13 competing standards and come, someone comes up with a new one, which integrates them. And now there's 14 competing standards. We really need to try new things. Yes. But then we need to know at what point can we compromise and, and join things up to make them stronger? Because that's what the publishers have done very successfully. That's why Elsevier has 2,000 journals, because they join uh, things up. They're thinking about that. They're, they're constantly thinking about this. So I think there needs to be some of that strategic thinking. And I think you don't necessarily need social media for any of that. What you need is strategy. You need to know the key people who are involved in the key initiatives and get them on board and Social media is very useful for spreading the word, but I don't think it's essential. I do feel like academics, oh, we love to prove things from first principle. Let me prove using a model that that if we selected on the units of teams instead of units of individuals, you'd have a more robust record. And let me publish that paper in a computing science journal. I get that, right? It's very tempting. But I think we really fall down on political strategy. Um, and that's the part where we could use education, admit we're not great about it. So your point about st standing on the backs of the publishers to use their platforms, is just very sensible, right? I, to me, that seems really right. Well, it's the only way, I think, yeah, being pragmatic. And I think, yeah, sometimes you have to, I remember one of the very first talks I ever gave on registered reports, so somebody stood up and said that by doing this with an Elsevier journal, I'd betrayed the scientific community. And I, fair, fair enough, took it out on the chin, you know, but that's the, that's the price you have to pay. If you want to get things done, you have to accept you're going to be morally imperfect. And then you have to use that as a stepping point to something better. Um, and, I, you know, this is this is pragmatism. And I, there's not enough of this. There's Academics love to nitpick. You give them an initiative or an improvement and they'll find everything wrong with it or could possibly go wrong with it. And they'll use that as an excuse to go back to what they were doing before whilst ignoring all of the problems with what they've already got, the status quo. This is academic... This is the academic mind is how it works. It's, you have to shake free from that to some extent, I think, to get anything done. But I'm optimistic that we're doing that. I really think we are. That there's, there's, a, huge, there's a huge push now, um, and it's coming from all different sort of sectors within the academic community, that, that things are changing. Yeah, other yeah, questions? I just, yeah, go ahead. We, we, I heard somewhat a few years ago, and uh, Chris would have laughed he, he would have laughed like a, a man with a flip top head at this one and someone referred to the overnight success of registered reports. I think they were about seven years down at that particular point in time. Um, <laughs> as someone now who is attempting to build companies from scratch, the, there, is a, the, there is a bad duration mismatch between what people think is possible either with an, uh, an MVP, some idea that they come up by themselves, um, or with what they think will happen with an initiative and the time horizon actually necessary to be able to do something about this. It requires not, it, it is, there's no idea, this is such a complicated and settled system. There is no idea that is so good that hasn't been thought of where if we click our fingers, all of a sudden everything will be different. Progress looks like what Chris does if you're talking about it in a formal sense. And it looks like Chris, what Chris does because it's had its 10 year anniversary a little while back. And probably for the first three or four years, it was only weirdos like me who were genuinely interested in what the model actually offered. And the, the, the ability to outlast the processes that will prevent you from making something like that normal is, is part of the key. I've said this before in talks, and I don't want to monopolize the conversation here, but I like to repeat this everywhere I go. There's no more dangerous word in the discussion of everything to do with academic infrastructure and the environment that we've collectively created than the word should. We should. This should happen. 
because first of all, it's not reckoning with the practicalities of what has to happen. You go, okay, well, let's let's see a business plan, right? Let's see a strategy. There's a key word. Um, but it's it's also a temptation to, uh, as your man says, find out all the things that might not conceivably work with it before it's actually happened. I mean, if you could cancel global publishing with a cranky tweet, we probably would have canceled it by now. You can't click your fingers and define multi-billion dollar businesses out of the publicly traded companies out of existence. It's like it's like trying to cancel ExxonMobil or cancel Hyundai. It's not going to work like that. You have to understand their time horizon and business model. Then an astonishing amount of patience and hard work is required. I know that's a really annoying answer, but it's the only one I've got. Dan, I'll come to you in one second, but I want to give a shout out to low-key middle-aged women working in libraries, R&I departments at universities, trying to get funders up and running, you know, including the, 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 the sub funders of U- UKRI, they're like real quiet. They're radical, right? Like if you want to change pure so that your university tracks which publications are registered reports and get them to consider that and what gets printed out when it goes to the ref pre-screening at your university, you should do that. You should talk to the middle-aged lady at the library who's actually in charge of the interface of pure. So I, I think we shouldn't, we need some bombastic leaders at the head, like like challenging people aggressively. And then we just need like a whole bunch of quiet doers just reshaping the way our GUIs look when we input, you know, research outputs for, for, for ref assessment. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off, Dan. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I completely agree with um, Chris and James that you have to work with the system as it is if you want to make change. And I think that a lot of the reform efforts that have happened in the past have failed because they didn't take that enough into account. They were like, if only everyone were to do X, where thing is X is what they were planning to do, uh, then the problem would be solved. But it, it, it's just not realistic to, to do that. Um, just for, um, from, from our point of view, what we are planning to do is very much to work side by side and alongside the existing system. However, having said that, uh, there is a danger of allowing the publishers to be, the, the, the commercial publishers to be too strongly involved in all of this, in that they're very, very good at co-opting reform efforts. And we've seen that with uh, open access, right? So we, we now have lots of open access, but we're now paying APCs, uh, and those are incredibly expensive. And so only people from rich institutions can afford to pay them. Uh, and actually, ultimately, their profits have gone up as a result of the switch to open access. So. Um, I don't know if we can outwit them on that front. Um, I feel like I we want to outwit funder, them. Funder platforms. So Welcome Trust has a platform for publishing their results, you know, independent of, of journals, and potentially prestigious, like a nice brand recognition there. That seems to have been a bit quiet. Is there much move for more funders to do things like that? I, 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 not a similar one, but I, I don't again. think many know about it. it, it European Research Council has got something similar, for, but it, in each case, it's for the research funded by them. Um, they are both, I mean, I, I published a lot in Welcome Open Research and think it's great, um, but I think they're not terribly well known outside the UK. And I think the ERC one, you know, they need more people submitting to it. It's a different model. I mean, it's like anything, it just proceeds slowly. But I think the funders have a vested interest, one would hope, in ensuring that their the work they fund is, is available to people uh, without them paying huge sums of money for it. One thing I've learned working with funders is that they're very scared of academics. They, they are. I, yeah, I, I, I was surprised at this actually, because I always think of funders as being kind of the top of the food chain. And you get a lot of you get a lot of comments, you know, from people when they reflect on this, these topics that, oh, just change the way the funders work, change the way the funders work. But funders feel like they have to do certain things because the scientific community instructs them to. And funders are worried that scientists will um, object very loudly if they if they start making rules like uh, you we are no longer paying APCs at all. You can put your manuscript on a preprint server and update it after each round of review and you get a green open access and then whatever you do after that, we don't care, we're not paying a cent. There'd be absolute pandemonium, they, they think, if, if they did that, they're extremely conservative. And for that reason, they're often the last to act. 
Um, and so I actually, I really agree with your point earlier, Jess, where you said, let's plant some spies and, and, and assassins within these funding organizations, because that's what we really need to change those things. And we need some funders with a little bit of vision. And it's difficult to find that within the ranks of UKRI, unfortunately. So I was thinking about how we keep, I could talk, um, we need dinner and drinks and to like, to like select spies and get them planted. So thinking about like next step forwards, I've really enjoyed the UK reproducibility network. If there's people who consider themselves junior or not very educated on the topic or who are interested in becoming a spy and getting planted at UKRI, I can highly recommend joining the UK reproducibility network. Your university might have a rep but it might be a central place where we can try to get together. There isn't much of a meta science community because we don't get paid to do meta science, but it's something maybe worth thinking about going forward. Maybe James, James, are you there? The research on research Institute might be a place as well for us to stay, stay central and stay chatting. <laughs> Big thumbs up. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thanks for your indulgence for letting us run 21 minutes over. It's been absolutely delightful and I'm glad to see everyone. And I hope we can keep chatting and keep making the good changes here.